uh, thank you very much. Welcome to this uh, Poster Spotlight session uh, on uh, insights uh, from single cell spatial and artificial intelligence approaches. I will be your moderator for this session. My name is Glenn Brooks. I'm uh, working as a pathologist and uh, as a bioinformatician at the large network of hospitals in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, normally, uh, my colleague Roberto Salgado will have moderated this session, but she, he couldn't be here in time, unfortunately. Uh, he asked me to apologize on his behalf. We have a very full session. Um, each half of the session will comprom comprise of uh, four uh, presentations, uh, followed by a discussion and a panel discussion. Each presentation can take up to four minutes so that the discussion and the panel discussions can have uh, each have seven minutes uh, duration. As first, I would like to introduce Marit Fjortoft uh, to the podium to present her uh, presentation. Thank you for the kind introduction and for the opportunity for me to present my project here in this session. The aim of this study is to explore connections between the immune profiles of primary tumors and the corresponding lymph nodes. We have used 56 samples from the Oslo 2 breast cancer cohort, 28 primary tumors and 16 matched sentinel nodes with met without metastasis, five sentinel nodes with metastasis, and seven metastatic axillary nodes. The samples were dissociated into single cells and uh, stained by a 47 antibody marker panel and analyzed by mass cytometry. The samples were then clustered using flowsome clustering algorithm, uh, which identified 34 immune cell populations, four tumor cell population and two apoptotic cell populations. In figure 1a to the upper left, we look at the immune cell composition in primary tumors and lymph nodes separately. The bar plots show all 34 immune cell clusters colored by its main cell population, and we see how the immune composition differs between the two tissues. In figure B, when dividing the primary tumors and lymph nodes by the clinical parameter lymph node status, we look at each of the 34 immune cell clusters separately, here shown by CD4 naive and CD8 exhausted T cells. And we find that in the lymph nodes to the far right, there is a skewing from naive to exhausted T cells in the metastatic axillary node samples compared to the sentinel nodes. However, we find no differences between the primary tumors, regardless of the lymph node status. We performed unsupervised clustering of primary tumors and lymph nodes separately, which resulted in three and four immune profile clusters, respectively. However, when we link the two together, shown in this Sankey plot, we find no correlation between the immune profiles. And from a separate cohort with more focus on tumor cells, we find that tumor cells in small lymph node metastasis have a mesenchymal-like phenotype by higher expression of the EMT markers Vimentine and CD44, and a lower expression of the epithelial markers EPCAM, pancytocarotene, e cadherin and estrogen receptor. And this was in contrast to tumor cells in larger metastasis, which had an epithelial-like phenotype. So to conclude, the immune cell composition in lymph nodes uh, depends on the lymph node status. The immune cell composition in primary tumors does not depend on the lymph node status. And the immune cell composition in the lymph nodes are not reflected in the primary tumors. And tumor cells from small lymph node metastasis have a mesenchymal-like phenotype, while tumor cells from large metastasis have an epithelial-like phenotype. And as a next step, we want to validate the tumor cell findings by multiplex immunofluorescence. And we are also currently analyzing data from 450 sentinel nodes, both with and without metastasis. And we will investigate the immune profiles further, focusing on breast cancer subtypes. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Yi Zhao 
Chiang from the Fudan University Shanghai Center in China. He would uh, log in online for this session. I don't know if it's working already. Hello. <laughs> You can start if you like. We need more sound. until uh, this works. I can go over to the next speaker until... Uh Hi there, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, hello. Um, welcome. Um, you can start if you like. Uh. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the technical issues. Thank you all. It's my pleasure to be presenting here. And I'm Dr. Ying Xu from Fudan University Shanghai Cancer Center. Before diving into the topic of my presentation, I would like to extend my sincere apology. Due to continuously adjusted policy of my hospital, I regret to be unable to deliver this presentation in person and apologize for any possible inconvenience like just now. And now let's focus our discussion. My presentation revolves around the exploration of single cell metabolic profiling, uncovering a normal precision immunotherapy strategy in triple negative breast cancer. And all of the co-authors have no financial relationships to disclose. As we all know, immunotherapy has emerged as a novel cornerstone in the treatment of TNBC. However, its benefits have been observed in only a limited subset of patients. The intricate metabolic interplay between cancer cells and microenvironmental cells remotes the T TME and exerts a significant impact on the responses of immunotherapy. Thus, we aim to unravel the metabolic features of individual cell types within the TMBC ecosystem and re reveal the effect of their metabolic interplay on the efficacy of immunotherapy. To achieve this goal, we divided our research into four distinct steps. First, we developed a new TMBC immunotherapy cohort for single cell RNA sequencing. Second, we conducted a comprehensive single cell metabolic analysis to illustrate the metabolic features among cell types. And third, we delved into identifying representative cell subsets to propose the potential metabolic crosstalk and explored the underlying mechanisms. Lastly, we targeted the key metabolic crosstalk between these identified cell subsets proposing translational strategies for potential clinical application. Briefly, we performed a comprehensive single cell metabolic analysis from three dimensions, metabolic genes, pathways, and fluxes. This systematic approach allowed us to intricately characterize the detailed metabolic heterogeneity of distinct cell types within the TME. Further, we found that CCO3 could identify a macrophage subset featured by enhanced endotumor immunity and active oxidative metabolism. 
Conversely, a subset of tumor cells exhibited an elevated reliance on growth sign metabolism, conferring re resistance to immunotherapy. And these two were negatively correlated and especially discrete. Experimental, we showed that GSTP1 mediated the consumption of glutamine by tumor cells and competitively promoted the therapeutosis of CCL3 positive macrophages, impending anti tumor immunity. Finally, we demonstrated that the inhibition of GSTP1 could enhance the response to immunotherapy in TNBC. In conclusion, we leveraged the single cell RNA sequencing to profile the functional and metabolic states of microenvironmental cells in an immunotherapy cohort of TNBC. And specifically, we found that GSTP1 mediated the consumption of glutamine by tumor cells could competitively promote therapeutosis of CCL3 positive macrophages impending anti tumor immunity. And targeting this GSTP1 CCL3 axis, we could demonstrated that the utilization of the GSTP1 inhibitor, which is an FDA-approved drug, could sensitize cells to immunotherapy. And in general, our promising finding highlights the potential significance of modulating cell-cell metabolic interactions in sensitivity in TNBC to immunotherapy, representing a paradigm shift in the field of immunometabolism. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Our next speaker is Saranya Shumsri from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the spatial resolved single cell atlas of the um, tumor immune architecture. Um, um, review the central role in Mayo Clinic um, triple negative breast cancer cohort and then the Phoenix X trial. Um, so emerging, um, several studies now has established the pivotal role of pre-existing immune response measured by tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TIL in triple negative breast cancer. Emerging study also show that it's not just the amount of these cells, but also the location of these cells are also important. Um, there are three distinct immune architecture that has been described in the literature, namely the immune desert, immune excluded, and immune enriched tumor. And in our study, we define immune desert tumor as tumor with stromal T less than 30%. Um, immune excluded and immune enriched both have stromal T greater than 30%, but immune excluded tumor has intratumoral CD8 protein expression, less than median, and then enriched has more than median. We further look at these immune architectures in Mayo Clinic triple negative breast cancer cohort. So this is a cohort of early stage triple negative breast cancer treated with conventional cytotoxic chemotherapy. We found that when you look at um, recurrent free survival of these patients as expected, pa um, patients that had um, immune enriched tumor, they had um, you know, significantly um, improved outcome compared to the immune desert group. On the other hand, interestingly, if you look at immune excluded tumors, so these patients, even though they had high stromal till, they actually appear to have poor outcome similar to um, the immune desert group. And then we later on use um, single cell spatial technology with the nanostring cosmic platform to look at deeper in, you know, not just the, um, can we go back please? Not, not, not just in um, you know to, um, um, cell um, amount of cell infiltration and the location, but also the type and the activation status of these cells. So we um, also um, separate them into two intratumoral niches versus the stromal niches, um, and then we further look at cellular composition of this immune architecture. So if you see the uh, figure on the left, when you look at um, different immune architecture, um, as um, expected, immune enriched tumor has high immune infiltrates in both stroma and the intratumoral, but then immune excluded had higher immune infiltrate mainly in the stroma. One thing that we noticed um, quite strikingly is that in tumors that are um, immune desert and immune excluded, they have significantly lower amount of intratumoral plasma cytoid dendritic cells compared to the immune enriched tumor. 
We further do the gene exp um, enrichment analysis and looking at the difference between um, these um, three different immune architecture. What we found was that um, in, in the um, um, in the um, immune enriched tumors, they had high um, uh, expression of the interferon alpha and interferon gamma compared to the, the other two subtypes. And then when we further look at different gene expression, gene that are mainly um, highly expressed in the immune enriched tumor are mainly gene that related in the antigen presenting genes uh, when compared to the other two groups. We further validate our finding in the FinVEC-X trial within the triple negative cohort in that particular trial. What we found was that patients that had high enrichment of the interferon alpha signature had significant um, improvement in both recurrent free survival and overall survival. So in summary, um, our study highlights the importance of um, spatial context, we also um, identify that patients with immune excluded tumor, despite having high stromotil, um, appear to have poor outcomes similar to immune desert. And using more in-depth um, single cell spatial analysis with um, specially um, uh, defined context, we also identify potential important roles of intratumoral plasma cytoid dendritic cells, as well as um, interferon alpha um, signaling in triple negative breast cancer. Thank you. And then our next speaker is uh, Fabiana Napolitano from the UT Southwestern Medical Center at Dallas, Texas. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of my co-authors, I'm going to present our results on how tumor immune microenvironment modulates resistance to estrogen suppression in your positive breast cancer. And I have no disclosure. Hormone positive or negative breast cancer is the most frequent subtype of breast cancer diagnosed worldwide. And recent evidences have demonstrated that tumor immune microenvironment plays a pivotal role in tumorigenesis progression and metastatic spread of breast cancer. Our goal is to investigate the role of tumor immune microenvironment in modulating response and resistance to estrogen suppression. To do so, we collected samples from a previous clinical trial that enrolled postmenopausal patients diagnosed with stage 1 to 3 ear positive breast cancer. These patients were treated from biopsy until surgery with letrozole and aromatase inhibitor inducing estrogen suppression. And based on the CAI 67 scores at the time of the surgery, we were able to identify patients that were sensitive to the treatment and that were resistant to the treatment. The patients were enrolled in two different institutions, so we used the first cohort, and we previously have demonstrated that resistant tumors showed an upregulation of um, proliferation signatures as well as immune uh, gene-related signatures like interferon alpha, interferon gamma, and alpha graph rejection. We found that resistant tumors showed an enrichment of stromal tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And we used cyclic immunofluorescence to analyze the intratumoral infiltration, and we found that immune cells were upregulated in um, the resistant tumors, in particular CD8 positive T cells and CD20 positive B cells. We are using now the second core to analyze the, the samples and to use the spatial transcriptomics to analyze the cancer cells compartment that are PANCK positive and the immune cell compartment identified by CD45. What we found in the surgical samples is that um, after treatment, the cancer cell compartment of the resistant tumors showed an upregulation of genes related with proliferation as well as with interferon signatures. In particular, we found pathways upregulated in terms of proliferation, T cell immunity, and antigen processing and presentation. In particular, we found T cell toxic cytotoxicity and chemokine signaling. The immune cell compartment was analyzed using CyberSort to infer the cell um, immune cell subtype um, distribution, and we found the resistant tumor showed an enrichment of CD8 positive T cells as well as M1 macrophages, while sensitive tumors showed an upregulation of uh, T-Rex. When we analyzed the immune cell compartment at the time of the biopsy, we found that prior to endocrine therapy, CD8 positive T cells are already enriched in the resistant tumors together with M0 macrophages, and in terms of pathway, we found an upregulation of uh, T cell proliferation, activation, cytotoxicity. In conclusion, using the spatial transcriptomics approach, we were able to validate our previous findings. Therefore, CD8 positive T cells are enriched in resistant tumors. T-Rex, FOXP3 positive cells are enriched in sensitive tumors. 
Moreover, we were able to define the path we self-regulated in the endocrine resistant tumors at both the cancer cell and the immune cell levels, in particular antigen processing, T cell activation, chemokine signaling. We are currently investigating the chemokines, in particular CXL9, 10, and 11. They were associated with worse relapse free survival, and it seems they can stimulate uh, an endocrine and an estrogen independent proliferation of your positive breast cancer. And we are um, uh, investigating if this subtype of uh, tumor that are CD8 positive T cell enriched and enriched in the chemokines, if this can be the ones that can be um, uh, immune infiltrated and benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors. Thank you all for these nice presentations. Now, Ratna Vatlamudi from, from the UT Health San in San Antonio will uh, discuss the four uh, previous presentations. Thank you. Thank you for staying the late evening listening to these posters. Um, the reviewers uh, are presenters of the four posters. I don't have any disclosure. So these are the four posters. I'm gonna summarize very brief and their impact. So one common theme uh, in these not moving. Can you move the slides? It's not moving. Okay, sorry. I'm clicking the wrong one. I lose some time. So the common theme uh, in these uh, four posters is uh, these are focused on tumor microenvironment, uh, and um, they used uh, very clinically relevant tissues such as primary tumors, metastasis, uh, FFP, and frozen tissues, tumor samples from the clinical trials. That's why these are very relevant materials. Uh, and they use state-of-the-art technology, including spatial genomics, single-cell RNA sequencing, uh, single-cell uh, metabolomics, and spatial multivomics. Um, they found uh, several key uh, findings. Some of these uh, um, results uh, identified uh, new immunological changes between uh, primary and metastasis, uh, new therapeutic targets uh, for future uh, therapies. Uh, they also identified a central role for uh, PDC, which secretes a lot of interferons in the, in the tumors. Um, and also uh, some of the these posters identified new pathways uh, and also some of these implications have uh, new targeted therapies. Uh, let's go with this slide. Uh, in the first one, uh, Ms. Merritt and her colleagues um, analyzed uh, single cell sequencing of primary tumors as well as metastatic tumors. Uh, interestingly, there is no correlation uh, between the immune profiles of primary tumors with the lymph node tumors. Uh, the second key observation from this thing is there is no correlation with the primary tumors uh, with the tumor node status. Uh, however, they found an interesting find. The, within the nodes, uh, status dictates the immune profiles um, between the uh, lymph nodes and other nodes. They also did some uh, additional analysis of the tumor samples. Uh, they found when the tumor size is small, uh, metastatic uh, things, they have um, a different mesenchymal uh, kind of markers compared to the tumor cells came from the large metastasis. So the, collectively, these findings have implications. So we cannot um, design therapies based on the immune profile of the primary tumors. So as these tumors are different from the metastatic tumors, so the new strategies uh, in the future should involve targeting both uh, different uh, microenvironments. Uh, in the second poster, um, Dr. Ju and his group from uh, Fidon, she couldn't make it here, but she presented online. Um, they used um, the hypothesis um, that uh, uh, intricate metabolic interaction between cancer cells and tumor microenvironment may play a role in immune therapy outcomes. Um, they used uh, state-of-the-art uh, single-cell sequencing as well as metabolic profiling. Uh, their results conclude uh, the enzyme GSTP1, which is uh, involved in the glutamine uh, uh, metabolism, uh, uses a lot of glutamine and depriving the glutamine from the macrophages, CCL3 um, macrophages. So then uh, they go undergo the cell death using paraptosis pathway. Uh, they proved this concept in preclinical models um, by treating uh, two different ways. So they knocked down a GSPT1 gene, 
uh, and also they used pharmacological inhibitor of GSTP1. Using both models, they demonstrated the tumor cells are now more sensitive to the immune therapy. So these findings uh, pave a new uh, pathway or target uh, for targeting the metabolism. Um, then this, uh, the, 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 this um, uh, third poster uh, that's presented by Swimstree used a, a novel uh, spatial technology. So they profiled uh, immune um, uh, profiling from these tumors and they classified these tumors in three different classes, uh, immune enriched, immune excluded. The key finding is uh, the immune enriched has better survival than immune excluded despite they have the similar uh, tumor infiltrating cells. Uh, then the other discovery they made is this uh, PDC cells are very high in immune enriched tumors. Uh, considering they are secreting interferons, they may be promoting the immunity. Uh, and also uh, transcript analysis also showed interferons uh, alpha and gamma uh, genes are very highly upregulated. Uh, collectively, these cells uh, shows the power of uh, spatial genomics uh, combining with the single cell technology. Uh, and also these uh, could serve as a markers for identification whether the, the patients respond to the better therapies. Uh, in the last one uh, is focused on the uh, determining the, how the tumor microenvironment affects the ER positive breast cancer therapy. Um, especially they were looking therapy resistant uh, and therapy sensitive and here the treatment is the estrogen deprivation. Uh, they found some key uh, important findings that saying when the tumors are resistant, they have more uh, immune uh, signatures. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the genes uh, analysis showed uh, several genes involved in proliferation and antigen and T cell immunity are upregulated in these tumors. Um, and uh, compared to the pre existing tumors, uh, treated tumors have high levels of uh, uh, these uh, genes. Uh, CXCL8, uh, 10, and 11. And these uh, differences existed even before therapy. So then uh, these study results have implications in identifying patients who can uh, be resistant uh, in early stage. So that provides the clinician to do additional therapies such as uh, um, antibody target for PDL, PD1 therapies for these patients who has these altered uh, markers. Um, I'll stop here. Uh, we can open this in the panel discussion. Uh, when you want to ask questions, come to the podium uh, speakers uh, or the, uh, and then say your name and you can ask the question. Thank you. So if anyone from the audience wants to ask a question, please go over to a mic. Uh, over. I hope you can hear me. Not yet quite uh, The microphone as as is a bit be. low. <laughs> <laughs> but OK. Um, I will put it back, Marlene. Uh, I was wondering, uh, regarding the talk about the single cell sequencing, the, the primary tumor versus the cells in the lymph nodes, you don't see so much difference between the single cells in the primary tumor versus what you see in the lymph node. We know from studies done on metastasis, distant metastasis, that you might see quite a few changes there. Could that indicate that um, the metastasis to the lymph node is mainly a more passive process, not so much driven to additional um, yeah, mutation events or whatever. How, what, is, what is the biology behind it that you assume is there? Apparently we had some difficulties by uh, hearing the question very well. Um, could you repeat the question, please? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, there, the, the, in, the, in the study where the single cell sequencing was done uh, from the primary tumor versus the metastasis in the lymph nodes, there was not so much difference in the, I would say, the DNA uh, from, from the primary tumor cells versus the metastasis in the lymph node. 
Now we know from an, a lot of other studies that in distant metastasis you see quite a few mutations, additional mutations. Could it indicate that muta metastasis from the primary tumor to the lymph node is m basically a more yeah, passive process or driven by other factors rather than what happens to distant metastasis? What is the biology behind this? Uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question, I'm afraid. Uh, do you have any? No, I, it, there is no difference uh, in the immune profile if the primary tumor is supplying uh, these cells to the nose. Is that correct? Oh, sorry, the sequencing, the, the, the profiling, sorry. I'm okay. not sure I didn't do the assay, but I interpret uh, the differences. Uh, there is no, the differences are there, but they're not same. Yeah, okay. okay. Yes, please, the next question. So I have a question for Dr. Napolitana. Uh, congratulations on your work. Um, it's of course very counterintuitive, right? That um, a resistant tumor has more immune effector cells. So could it be the case that you select basically for a more triple negative like phenotype and that we shouldn't conclude that we are inducing a kind of anti-cancer immune response, but it's simply reflecting that biology changes by the pressure of endocrine treatment? Thank you. So um, the patients enrolled were all ER positive. Uh, when, when we did the analysis, for example, for uh, POM50 subtypes, and we did not find any enrichment, for example, for beta types, so I wouldn't say that the resistant tumors showed um, much more similarity to triple negative, but they uh, do have this, there is this subgroup, there is um, this en enrichment of immune cells in general, in particular of CD8 positive cells. Uh, this is not something completely new. There are some previous uh, publication about this, and when investigating, maybe there is, um, we are investigating chemokan, if that is maybe, the, the chemokans I was showing are um, this uh, CD8 positive recruitment. They are responsible for that, so we think that there is a completely different um, response of the ER positive uh, breast cancer and breast cancer cells to the uh, immune infiltration, but I wouldn't say they look similar to triple negative. Um, I wouldn't go that far. We have time for two more questions. I will first start with uh, the left mic. Hi. <coughs> Hi, Hari Nakshatri from Indiana University. It's a similar question of what came up a few minutes ago. Are we seeing a dichotomy with the, between ER positive and ER negative? Have you looked whether your T cells are exhausted phenotype? And surprise is the T regulatory cells enrichment showing the superior outcome. That seems to be odd with most other data. Um, I think I, I understood uh, the first half, the second half was not very clear. Here we have some kind of problem with the, uh, with the acoustic, I think. On the CD8 positive T cells, you asked it. Are they exhausted phenotype? Mm -hmm. So, um, I cannot say for sure because we did not do a uh, single cell on that, but we did investigate the cytolytic score that is highly enriched. So we uh, can, this kind of suggests that there is at least an IRM, we compared the cytolytic score uh, in the resistant versus sensitive and they are um, hyperactivated. So those that are there, they have, uh, they seem to have an, uh, an, act an, an activity, uh, a positive activity. So they do like, they are like anti-tumor. And I think there was another part on T-Rex. The T-Rex. Yes. Usually, if you have more T-Rex, that is associated with bad outcome. But in your case, you're seeing a good outcome. Yes. So um, the T-Rex, we found them enriched using multiple analyses, so multiple approaches. Um, so I am kind of convinced by the data. We found them enriched both by um, uh, in cyclic immunofluorescence and using the cybersort approach on two different cohorts. Um, why they are enriched, we still don't know. And um, I know it looks different compared to, for example, triple negative, but I am approaching this data like they are completely different um, tumors. So it seems that um, if we use 
uh, the ER positive as an entire group, and we analyze the CD8 positive cells and T-Rex, we can find them, the, for example, CD8, and in general, TILs, they are lower compared to triple negative, but inside of the group of ER positive, there are uh, different distribution of cells, so I don't know why they are more, but they are, so I'm sorry. Yes, Aubrey Thompson, Mayo Clinic. Uh, a comment really more than a question related to the analysis of the immune microenvironment surrounding cells in a tumor nest versus those in a lymph node. When you use single cell sequencing, conventional single cell sequencing, you lose all spatial context. So I, I think you need, to be, uh, you need to be careful in terms of interpreting those data because you don't really know whether you're interpreting the characteristics of the immune cells that are actually within the proximity, immediate proximity of the tumor cells are not. That's the question that you really need to answer. You need to know if the, the immune cells that are actually interacting with the tumor uh, cells in the tumor are different from the immune cells that are actually interacting with the tumor cells in the lymph node. And I don't think you can do that with conventional single cell sequencing. You need spatial technology to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the speakers from the first half. Then I would like to invite all the speakers from the second half and also the discussant, of course. So maybe the first speaker can al already go to the podium. Uh, it's uh, Carmen van Dooyenweert from the University Medical Center in Utrecht uh, from the Netherlands. All right, thank you very much for the opportunity to present our research here. So I'll be talking to you today about our uh, clinical trial, the Confident B trial, which was on the clinical implementation of an AI-assisted detection of breast cancer metastases in sentinel lymph nodes. I have no disclosures. So, as we all know, sentinel lymph nodes in breast cancer are very important for clinical management. However, for pathologists, a sentinel lymph node assessment is actually a task that is time-consuming, it's tedious, and it's costly, which makes it actually an ideal task for AI assistance. And the reason why it's costly is because we first, or we in the University Medical Center Utrecht, we first look at the HE slides, which is in our case five HE slides per um, tissue block. And if we don't see any metastases by eye, we perform immunohistochemistry chemistry stains. And these are quite expensive because they're $26 per stain. So that means times five. So we performed a single center prospective pragmatic clinical trial in which we investigated to which extent an AI-assisted workflow reduces the use of immunohistochemistry chemistry per case of positive sentinel lymph nodes. Um, while we actually maintain the current safety standards, and I'll come back to that in a second. So what we did is that we included all consecutive sentinel lymph node samples from September 2022 to May 2023, which were in total 190 samples. And in this case, participants were not the patients, but the five expert breast pathologists from our hospital. So on the right side, you actually see our flow chart. On the far right, you see the control arm in which there was an HE slide or five HE slides per sentinel lymph node block which was assessed by a pathologist, and if he saw, uh, or she, uh, saw metastases by eye, that was the conclusion, but in case no metastases were detected, we, they performed immunohistochemistry chemistry stains, which were, of course, then also assessed by a pathologist. So on the left side, you see the uh, intervention arm, nothing different except now the HE slide was first assessed by the algorithm, which was then presented to the pathologist. And the output of the algorithm, you can see it on the far right uh, bottom corner, uh, was actually just a red, uh, orange, or yellow outline. So moving on to the results. So our main outcome was uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry use per detected case of sentinel lymph node metastases, and in total we detected 59 metastases. And of course, we used less immunohistochemistry chemistry stains in the AI arm, which resulted in an adjusted relative risk of immunohistochemistry chemistry use of 0.68, which was significant indicating that we reached a 32% reduction of immunistic chemistry use in positive lymph nodes. So moving on to the pathologist performance, sensitivity of the pathologist went up by 30% for isolated tumor cells and also for micrometastases, 
and reach 100% for macrometastases. Also, the negative predictive value of pathologists went up by 10%. Then moving on to the workflow improvements. So um, we reached a significant time reduction. The pathologist in the AI arm spent a mean of below four minutes, while the pathologist in the control arm spent over six minutes for the assessment of sentinel lymph nodes. And also what's very important is that all pathologists stated that the algorithm was very easy to use, it made their work more enjoyable, and they prefer working with the algorithm in the future. Moving on to the final conclusion is we looked at cost reductions and, and we already saved by doing the trial alone $3,000. And of course you can think of many ways how to use the uh, AI algorithm in the future and if you look at the most rigorous scenario you can save up to over $13,000 uh, for 100 sentinel lymph nodes. So we'd like to conclude that the implementation of AI assistance for breast cancer sentinel lymph node assessment is first of all safe, patients are not at risk of an inferior diagnosis, it leads to a significant reduction of immunohistochemistry chemistry use and subsequent costs, and finally it leads to a significant time reduction for pathologists and it makes their work more enjoyable. Our next speaker is Marcelo Sobral Leite from the, Net the Netherlands Cancer Institute in the Netherlands. Good evening. Um, I'm uh, happy to present for you a morphometric signature that I developed at Netherlands Cancer Institute that's able to detect uh, DCIS, uh, ductal carcinoma in situ DCIS that have low risk of progression to invasive. Um, I have no disclosure. Um, so, uh, as you know, primary DCIS uh, is a pr potential, prog potential precursor of invasive breast cancer. However, a lot of those lesions will never uh, happen to become invasive. Once we don't know how to distinguish progressive from non-progressive, a lot of these women are treated uh, heavily with uh, uh, surgery uh, and also with radiotherapy. So it's really needed to have clinical biomarkers that can distinguish hazard from harmless, and then we can better dis decide a treatment uh, decision. So um, we hypothesized that the size of the CIS ducts, um, the geometric features and spatial configuration of those have kind of um, relation of, with the invasive uh, potential. Uh, so to answer this question, um, we then developed one artificial intelligence based uh, DCIS morphometric analysis pipeline um, that um, uh, is based on the steps of first uh, se selecting segment in the stroma and um, uh, detecting the CIS as pathologist and also nuclei uh, inside the CIS ducts. And this is shown to have a very good uh, yeah, agreement with pathologists and we end up having the uh, um, duct information of uh, the, with 15 morphological measurements. Uh, we summarize the variation of these morphometric features um, in uh, 55 morphometric variables uh, that we can get from every h and &E slides, like uh, average ductal area, total number of, uh, of cells inside the ducts, um, and we analyze it, um, the 689 h and &E slides come from a Dutch cohort of prime DCIS and we selected patients that uh, received the breast cancer surgery only, the CIS. Um, we analyzed uh, um, cases that we call the patients that uh, uh, experience uh, uh, invasive progression during the follow-up with a median follow-up of 12 years and also controls that never had any progressive uh, disease. Um, then uh, when we analyzed the ridge regression with cross-validation, we saw that these 55 morphometric variables have some prognostic value able to distinguish those that will progress from those that will not. Uh, when we look to the hierarchical clustering, then you can appreciate that, uh, yeah, I selected the four main clusters in the colors of the dendrogram, and then you can see that, uh, appreciated that the blue signature uh, are those that contain low values of uh, area of the ducts, low number of cells, comparably with the red signature that have more expensive um, ducts with larger uh, disease. Um, 
we concluded then that this morphometric signature identified DCIS lesions with low risk of progression, as you can see in the uh, ratio of uh, uh, the invasive uh, breast cancer risk uh, curve, you can see that the blue signature showed a low risk of uh, progression during the follow-up, uh, even when we uh, um, correct for grades, for age of diagnosis, ER, and HER2 receptors, and COX-2 receptor as well. Uh, this signature is characterized by uh, ducts, uh, or h &E slides that contain ducts with uh, low uh, DCIS stroma ratio, for example, which lower number of DCIS stroma ratio is, l is uh, lower sized um, uh, ducts. Um, we think that this uh, approach has a potential clinical utility to de-escalate DCIS management, and we are very keen to collaborate to uh, further validation of this slide, of these uh, results. And thank you for all collaborators and patients, and thanks for the Basic Science Award in, today, in this year. Thank you. Then our next speaker is Sarah Mizero from the Houston Methodist, Methodist Research Institute at Houston, Texas. Thank you. Actually, I recently transitioned to Artedis, so that's also my conflict of interest. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. This is a really wonderful program, and I've been here also last year. I, I really love that we're putting so much attention into spatial um, technologies right now. Uh, so today, I would like to talk a bit about um, what does spatial mean in terms of mechanics uh, and in terms of outcome for breast cancer. This is my financial disclosure. So in the past 10 to 20 years, there's been an increasing effort in really trying to elucidate the bio, uh, biomechanical cues that, that drive cancer outcome and response to treatment. And it's now pretty well established that uh, uh, physics is very important in determining whether or not a cancer cell metastasizes or immune cells uh, can activate and suppress cancer cell effectively. Uh, however, uh, the translational aspect of this field has really been um, uh, lacking so far, and one of the biggest reasons is we're really lacking effective biomarkers. Uh, a major, major um, breakthrough has been um, done with the technologies like uh, atomic force microscope that really probe the function of phenotypes. So they, are, you can think about them as nanopalpation, where you're really probing the mechanical properties, the stiffness, the softness, the vision of the cells. And these are the functional uh, properties that determines whether or not a cancer cell, for example, can metastasize. And so in this talk, uh, in this project, we really wanted to go and understand better what are the uh, molecular phenotypes that uh, describe best these uh, biomechanical phenotypes that then can determine outcome. And so for our um, approach, we used the Hyplex imaging based on imaging mass cytometry. We developed two different panels to understand, uh, uh, to look at the cancer signaling, uh, immune and mechanical markers. And then uh, uh, we analyzed this. Uh, um, we had a patient, big patient um, data set, uh, so we could correlate all of our results with um, clinical outcome and um, uh, survival. And then in addition to that, to really try to understand uh, and, uh, uh, and reveal the patterns of, uh, the, of, um, of spatial distribution, we developed um, a new algorithm to understand uh, uh, spatial co-localization of different uh, phenotypes found. And also this is sort of trying to describe really the uh, spatial distribution of mechanical phenotypes in breast cancer. And so among our results, uh, we first of all identify more than 50 new biomechanical phenotypes in breast cancer, and we interpreted them correlated with the uh, clinical features. And so I just wanna show you a couple of examples and I'm happy to discuss more by my poster. Uh, for example, we identified that the um, signature of early breast cancer stiffening, which uh, has been correlated with good outcome by this study and other studies, is really uh, due to an increased expression of fibronectin. Uh, another one, uh, I have a couple here, uh, another one that uh, we, um, that's really interesting is we elucidated one of the mechanisms by which cancer cells become softer and then they metastasize, which is due to hypoxia-driven um, EMT. And then finally, another uh, result that I wanted to share with you all is uh, uh, this, um, we have identified several uh, 
biomechanical different fibroblast phenotypes, and uh, we have identified a couple that are um, uh, tumor suppressing, tumor um, promoting as expected, and then also we have identified some that are more uh, less intuitive, and they uh, seem to suggest a. a uh, protective function of some fibroblast that it's really based on their, the building of a mechanical barriers around the tumor. And uh, there's been recently a lot of work in literature that it's emerging now that's really showing that fibroblasts are a very interesting population of cells and it's not uh, obvious whether they're always promoting or over cancer uh, suppressing. And so this is something that perhaps uh, with uh, uh, more understanding on their mechanical phenotypes we can really try to distinguish. And lastly, I just want to uh, leave you with what the next steps for us are. We are currently, uh, we opened a couple of months ago this uh, uh, multi-center clinical trial perspective clinical trial led by Dr. Thompson at uh, where the first sites are going to be Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and uh, in here, really, we're uh, trying to validate further uh, the power of nanomechanical signatures in predicting outcome of breast cancer. Thank you. And then uh, our next speaker is Anita Grigoriadis from the King's College London in the United Kingdom. Well, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present our observation that age-related features differ in normal breast tissue from women with germline BRCA1 and 2 mutation. And this, was, uh, this work was executed uh, by Mario Pareno Centeno and Sishan Shen in my group. So individuals with germline BRCA1 and 2 mutation face an elevated uh, risk of breast cancer. Due to advances in genetic testing, an increasing number of women carrying BRCA mutations are identified. And to prevent breast carcinogenesis, most of these women will eventually undergo risk Using mastectomy. So the challenge remains to get a better understanding of tumor initiation in the normal breast tissue so that we can deliver better risk estimates for these women. Aging is by far the most uh, important risk factor for sporadic breast cancer. And during aging, the human mammary gland continuously undergoes tissue modeling, which is most uh, prominently reflected in lobular involution. In 2022, uh, De Bell and colleagues have shown that lobular in involution can be captured well on digitized whole slide images from uh, h and &E stained normal breast tissue. So we hypothesis, does the normal breast tissue of BRCA carrier have a features of accelerated uh, epithelial aging? And can we quantify this by using deep learning approaches? For that, we set in place a computational pathological framework to capture breast epithelial aging. So first, we put in place a repository of normal breast tissue whole slide images. And here we utilize different biobanks and institutes. The normal breast uh, tissue from these individuals ranged uh, from, so these individuals had a range uh, uh, of risk, either whole, high or low risk, uh, to be able to expect this spectrum of risk for developing breast cancer. Then uh, we set in place a deep learning uh, a, a framework uh, called Breast HNET, where we started off by manually annotating whole slide images to build a robust and general tissue classifier to detect adipocytes, epithelial, and stroma. Focusing on the epithelial, we then built an age classifier with which we were able to identify where this normal breast tissue was derived from either a woman under 30 years of age or over 50 years of age. We applied breast HNET uh, to uh, external validation cohorts of normal breast tissues of non BRCA carriers, and we saw a good performance on the whole slide level and the tile level. Moreover, uh, we saw a consistency across multiple tissue blocks, uh, even when we took this tissue from different quadrants of the normal breast. 
and uh, reassuring uh, our age prediction of normal epithelial was associated with lower involution in reduction mammoplasties. But interestingly, when we applied this uh, epithelial age classifier to normal breast tissue of BRCA carrier, we saw a poor performance here shown on the left. We then said, okay, let's invest, uh, decade these whole slide images. And what we saw that uh, for some BRCA carriers, these whole slide images carried a high percentage of tiles predicted to be derived from normal breast tissue from women over 50. Although this normal breast tissue was obtained from women with a chronological age below 50. And an example here is shown on the right of an epithelial, which we now would call ex with ex uh, showing accelerated tissue aging. So in conclusion, uh, we have built a deep learning framework which can capture accelerated epithelial aging in normal breast tissue. And by now exploring this area molecularly, spatially, um, and uh, uh, cellularly, we might be able to identify biomarkers to detect cancer initiation, especially for women at risk of developing cancer. Thank you very much. And now Eugene Douglas from the University of Georgia will uh, discuss these four presentations. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so um, I'm gonna start with the kind of a 20,000 foot view of kind of the workflow for each of the, the previous four talks. Um, and then I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about a historical precedent that I find helpful uh, personally for kind of navigating this big data AI tool world that we live in um, today. So the, the, the first talk in this session, of, or this panel of this session, uh, focused on kind of questions about the validity and utility of AI um, digital pathology tools um, to evaluate uh, lymph node metastases. And uh, fortunately, they found improvements in sensitivity, um, cost, and, and time, sort of attesting to the potential utility of AI assistance um, generally. The, the next three talks um, were a little bit more basic, focused more on kind of tool development and there was also some generation of some novel biological insights. Um, so the, the fourth talk um, uh, that we just heard um, focused on more normal tissue and building a classifier to predict tissue age. And one of the key insights they found was that um, germline BRCA mutations seem to be associated with some sort of accelerated um, aging phenotype, um, which can be defined by morphological features. The, um, the third talk uh, focused on DCIS data, um, where they trained a classifier uh, to predict uh, potential future invasiveness. And um, some of the key insights uh, basically involved uh, DCS size and cellular ratios um, that seem to show reproducible predictive power. And finally, um, the, the, the final talk uh, used, or I guess the second talk, used uh, spatial, spatial proteomics technology to ask certain questions about uh, tissue biomechanics. And um, they basically found that um, certain characteristics of fibroblasts um, uh, that were associated with hypoxia and epithelial to mesenchymal transition um, pathways seem to be associated with treatment response. So, so these are very diverse studies that are kind of tr uh, where they develop tools that were trained on diverse data sets and have very kind of distinct biological insights about different stages of um, breast cancer development. And so, so how do we kind of in general, um, with all these kind of new tools and new insights that are being generated, how can we kind of navigate all of this information and kind of try to distill it into um, sort of relevant, meaningful insights that we can do something about. So, um, so I find it helpful to actually uh, use the history of quantum mechanics as a, um, as a model to sort of think about how to kind of navigate these questions. 
um, because um, 100 years ago, um, a lot of the development of early quantum mechanics uh, was kind of based on similar big data challenges as we have today in genomics and single cell um, and, and spatial technology, where basically a new technology um, basically generated a lot of um, big, very, very large data sets, and those data sets were initially only really parsable with statistical models that really quantified trends that didn't really give us information about like what those trends mean, meant. But ultimately, those statistical models translated into new insights, you know, which, like Planck's Law, that you know, eventually changed the world. And I first read about this story 10 years ago when I was a computational postdoc, um, and this quote in particular, I think, really kind of struck me um, because it feels even more applicable today um, in our modern world of, um, you know, modern computing and the internet um, than it does to, to 1903. But anyway, um, that kind of big data revolution started in around 1900, and then 30, around 30 years later, a lot of kind of ad hoc observations that were kind of recurrent across a lot of different systems started to be reconciled into a system of new ideas that was basically called quantum mechanics, which, you know, as we know from the movie Oppenheimer, uh, sort of revolutionized nuclear energy, but also people don't know as, as, as well that it kind of revolutionized, revolutionized modern organic chemistry directly leading to our ability to, um, to image the double helix of DNA um, because of restrictions on bond angles. Um, and together, organic chemistry and molecular biology, biology have obviously had important roles for, for the development of modern precision medicine. So, so, it, so anyway, um, the, the, the kind of point of talking about all this is um, in 1903 and today, I feel like often with a lot of these data sets and a lot of these insights, that there's, there's common patterns, we often feel kind of lost in a sea of data and tools, and it can be hard to navigate. But the, the key lesson I kind of learned from those biographies I read was that focusing on the kind of the common threads, the common logical um, trends across data sets could ultimately um, lead to uh, new, pro new procedures that significantly reduce the labor of, in physics case, mechanical calculations or data quantification or parsing um, to, for, for our data sets. Um, and ultimately, the discovery of new principles as a direct result of the kind of automation of the, the kind of rote, difficult labor. So, um, and as, as was talked about in the previous panel, some of these new technologies are directly enabling us to sort of apply the principles of physics at a systematic level to the tumor battlefield um, in a way we've never been able to previously. So, in, in summary, um, I think the, you know, it, sort of the, the key way to sort of pull together a lot of these, the, these large data sets, these new insights and these new tools um, is to sort of focus on the kind of common threads, the common rules between them, um, where ultimately the hope is that these recur recurrent ideas will basically lead to new ideas that can um, sort of change the world where ultimately these AI tools are not necessarily um, entirely the end, but a kind of a means to reducing the workflow so that we can kind of focus on the, the new ideas that are necessary for, for today's challenges. And um, I think one of the kind of current sort of trends across all of these studies was basically kind of the functional roles and flavors of the, the stroma. Um, um, and so, so yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's basically my summary. Um, hopefully this, this historical precedent is as useful to you as it is, for, to, it is to me in navigating this new very, very large literature. So thank you. So now we will have a small uh, panel discussion. So if there are any questions from the audience, please go to a mic and then uh, we will uh, let you ask a question. Maybe I would start by addressing something that I've learned from the first uh, presentation from uh, this uh, half of the session is the cost for machine learning or for art artificial intelligence in general for pathology labs. That's usually a huge problem because, well, on Larger labs have the resources to create their own models, but the smaller labs would need to rely on vendors, and vendors come with a high cost. So you need to start looking for the, those items where you can 
from cost reduction, and I'm very glad that you uh, have put this in your uh, presentation. Uh, yes, uh, at the left mic. Uh, hi, my name is Carlos Martinez from the University of Edinburgh. I you, you need to talk a little bit louder, we right. can't hear you. Okay, is that better? Yeah, my name is Carlos Martinez from the University of Edinburgh. I had a question about the DCIS poster. Two questions, really. Uh, so, uh, if I understood correctly, you identified this subgroup of samples uh, that were basically smaller lesions with like a different uh, ratio, cellular ratio. Uh, question one, do you think the time of diagnosis may be a factor, as in uh, has this DCIS have less time to develop and, and, and evolve. And question two, second part, do you think there might be something that's biologically different in this subset of DCIS lesions, uh, like meaning are these DCIS lesions genetically or transcriptomically different? And is that something you're interested in looking at? You mean radiological differences? Uh, it's, it's very difficult to uh, hear the, the, the question here. At the sorry, do you think they're biologically different? Besides, Biologically. Besides being oh, yeah. smaller, like at a genetic yeah, this, or transcriptomic level. This yeah. study, thanks for a question, very, very uh, good question. It, 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 this study was also inspi inspired by one uh, study uh, with uh, mouse models in which, yeah, one uh, postdoc uh, in the department, he used fresh tissue to inject yeah, um, DCIS uh, lesions, fresh DCIS lesions into mice. And uh, later on, after uh, observing these uh, mice after 12 months, uh, he observed that uh, by, via 3D analysis, via 3D uh, imaging of these, uh, the lesions uh, that grow after 12 months, he saw that some lesions were very um, uh, small and they call replacement growth and the other lesions were like more expanded, so they called it expansive growth. And then you saw that the expansive growth ones, they indeed, they uh, uh, were more, king, more uh, often becoming invasive. So then we tried to address this same question of measuring the size of the ducts, but in a 2D uh, way in order to have a more translational approach that can be used in daily based labs. So that's more or less the biology that has to do with um, yeah, the background of study. Hope you I answer. Hi, um, Chiara Corti, Oncology Fellow from Dana Farber, Boston. I have two questions for the Confident Bean study. Uh, the first one is related to the um, patient population. I was wondering if you had some insights, especially regarding the vendor's information about the training set and validation set, um, because some of the lymph nodes may be of patients previously receiving new adivan treatment that can contain features related to previous treatment. And the second question is related to the cost effectiveness analysis, because you reported a cost of more or less 3,000 euros but I was wondering if it is related to an agreement with the vendor or if it is really so cheap because tomorrow if a person is running a pathology department, I'm wondering what would be the cost of purchasing this algorithm. Thank you. Okay, so the first question was about the po patient population, right? So, the, yeah. So we included all consecutive samples which were from neoadjuvantly treated patients, but also adjuvantly treated patients, and those were actually all the patients that came in. Uh, there were no selection criteria. Um, so all subtypes are in there, all receptor positive, receptor negative, um, it's just what came up. Um, and we, of course, looked at all the receptors and all the character characteristics, and they were equally divided over both groups. Thank you, but do you know perhaps if the, um, the, um, the company provided information about uh, if and patients with previous neo treatment were included in the training set and validation set of the algorithm? Uh, we didn't know that, it, mm -hmm. whether it was trained on neo patients. Uh, we just used it. <laughs> and it's actually quite good also on the neo treated patients, although it has a, lit a little bit more trouble. It has a lot, of, lot more annotations, uh, but still it's only, I think on average, it was five annotations per slide, uh, which is a pathologist looks at it and sees in one second, oh, it's nothing. Um, so it has a little bit more trouble with the neoadjuvantly treated patients. Um, 
but it's still very good. And I think the second question was about the cost of the algorithm, right? Okay, so um, we have a, the license of this algorithm, um, and it was in a package deal with uh, stainers, uh, and it's also a deal in which we get all new breast cancer algorithms in the upcoming three years from that company. So we, yeah, we really cannot give a price uh, for what we've paid because it was a package deal, but um, yeah, we think a couple thousand um, dollars for the algorithm. Uh, okay. But still, I mean, if you look at the cost reductions, you earn it back quite fast. Okay, uh, we'll see uh, the, the cost in the market for other divisions without study, I mean, without an agreement. Thank you. We still have time for two last quick questions. Uh, first, the uh, left mic. Yeah, Mark Basic from uh, McGill. A uh, question for Sarah Nitzero. The um, very, very nice work. Uh, I, I got the very broad questions, I guess, but the first one, do you, in all your categories in your analysis, do you see any actionable or targetable uh, changes uh, in the, besides the usual FAP and so on, something that is in a signaling pathway, for instance, IGF-2 or IGFs, or that, that you're able to parse out in, in your analysis that are related to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, special, to the dynamics of the biomechanics of, of the lesions? I love that question, thank you. So yes, definitely everything is about uh, providing insights uh, to give, uh, to, to de lead to actionable changes. So one uh, that we're looking at right now is for example, how to decide whether to treat with taxins or platinum because they both affect cell mechanics in different ways and we can pick up these changes, especially with, the, with their TDS technology, but all of these platforms can sort of integrate and um, pick up these changes and then really providing this, uh, this guidance. So that's a big, big part of our clinical trial. Then the last question at the right mic. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Eddie Gill from uh, Texas A&M University. Um, I wanted to ask, what were some of the most surprising failure modes for each model, right? So some of the surprising false positives and false negatives. I didn't hear it quite well because we are suffering from a lot of echo at the front. Yeah, what were, what were some of the most surprising false positives and false negatives for the models? Things that you would have expected them to easily capture but weren't. Does he mean, do you mean in the algorithm or? Yeah, for the, for the deep learning algorithms. Yeah, so it also pointed out a lot of benign structures, uh, nerves, histiocytes, um, all kinds of things, blood vessels. Um, but just what I said, I mean, the pathologist looks at it one second, oh, it's nothing, and moves on. So, and, and it's also reflected by the time saving, right? So uh, it has a lot of false positives, but uh, still you're a lot faster because they only look at the outlines. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone, uh, you from the audience to stay here until the very end with us. Also all the speakers and discussants to be here for uh, making this session uh, very nice. Thank you so much. Also the organizers to help us out with all the techni uh, technicalities. Uh, good night, everyone. <laughs>